The most respected guy in all those years definitely was Mika Hakkinen. Great fights, but stable private relationship. Ayrton Senna or Alain Prost? Lewis Hamilton or Nico Rosberg? Mark Webber or Sebastian Vettel? Formula One has hosted fierce rivalries in the past, but in referencing the rivalry between Mika Hakkinen and Michael Schumacher, it's never felt quite the same. There really shouldn't be any difference between Hakkinen and Schumacher. What I've come to notice and what we'll ultimately explore in this video, this is one of the best, if not the only Formula One rivalry where it felt possible, encouraged even, to like and support both of these drivers. Their battles on the track always reflected the amount of respect they held for each other. All of this reached its peak and was on full display in the battle for the Formula One championship of the 2000 season, which is exactly where we pick up the action. Michael Schumacher has just helped Ferrari regain the Constructors' Championship. Mika Hakkinen has just become a double world champion. Schumacher is 100% healthy and back from his injury at Silverstone. The flying fan has had his time, but now it's Michael's turn for revenge. The 54th running of the championship would start a lot different than it had in the past. The only thing Mika would continue to have in his favor is qualifying pace. He would again, as he did in 1999, take pole position in consecutive races. The difference between this season and previous ones, Hakkinen had experienced mechanical failures. And in the past, Schumacher would have his own mechanical issues to deal with, and he would not be able to capitalize on those situations. But this was a different driver. This was a different Michael, more experienced, and the loss had seemed to have taught him things. The F1 2000 was also a different car. While Mika would suffer mechanical failure in both Australia and Brazil, Michael would take the checkered flag on both occasions. And at the third round in San Marino, Hakkinen would again be on pole. The two titans would duel for the lead. Hakkinen kept his position but eventually lost out to Schumacher in the second round of the pits. Schumacher would take his third consecutive win that season. But crucially for the reigning double world champion, he would get on the board for the first time this season with his six points while Coulthard would score four. After three rounds, Michael would lead Hakkinen 30 to Mika 6, with Barrichello and Fisichella at 9 and 8 respectively. After San Marino, Ferrari was a comfortable 29 points ahead of McLaren. They sat at 39 points compared to McLaren's 10. Hakkinen wouldn't see his first victory of the season until round 5 at the Spanish Grand Prix. At each of these three championship seasons, Hakkinen would be successful at winning all three Spanish Grand Prix. By the time we get to round 6 at the Nürburgring, McLaren has nearly made a full recovery from their abysmal start. Incredibly, both would finish on the podium for the fourth consecutive Grand Prix. Despite the constructor's battle tightening up, Schumacher stretched his lead with the win at the European GP. This also would include one of their quintessential on-track battles in wheel-to-wheel -wheel actions that I think represented the 2000 season perfectly. Schumacher made an overtake that, in hindsight, would represent to me the shift in the rivalry going more towards Michael. It occurs on lap 11. You can see here, Michael would overtake his finished rival at that chicane. He would then go on to cruise to a crucial victory, and it was as much psychological as it was a masterclass of driving. After round 6, Schumacher led 46 points compared to Hakkinen's 28, with Coulthard just 4 points behind him. Ferrari's lead had been chipped to 10 points as McLaren would earn 52 to Ferrari 62. Schumacher would do his best to dampen the comeback the fan was mounting by taking 3 consecutive poles at Monaco, Canada, and France. He'd only end up finishing one of those races, but at least in consolation, it was a victory in Canada. Hakkinen would be unable to capitalize on the misfortune seen by Schumacher. And for me, this is one of the most defining moments of the 2000 season, the one that makes it so different and diverging from the previous championship winning seasons by Hakkinen. In other seasons, he'd be able to take victories here, all 10 points. But in the 2000 season, he had problems of his own. And while Hakkinen is unable to take advantage of these opportunities, his teammate this time around, Coulthard, is able to. He would go on to take the win in France and ultimately in Monaco as well. The crown jewel of Formula One racing wasn't a glamorous affair for either of the two at the top of the grid that year. Both would have car issues, and while Michael was forced to retire from the race, Hakkinen would salvage a single point in P6 out of the event. Michael would bookend his nightmare Monaco Grand Prix by converting that pole position he earned in Canada into a race win. Ferrari would take their first 1-2 they had seen since the season opener. Hakkinen was unable to offset any of this and make up any significant ground as he'd end his Grand Prix weekend in 4th place. France would be a turning point, especially for Hakkinen, who had gone a little cold compared to his other seasons. Mika would go on a spree of positive results, while Michael would suffer a string of non-finishes and would fail to win another Grand Prix until his home race. Over the next 5 events, Hakkinen would place runner-up to his teammate in France, 
win in Austria, runner-up in Germany, win in Hungary, and win in Belgium. Schumacher would retire the car in three straight races, but would mount two incredible runner-up finishes in Hungary and Belgium. While all this is going on at the top, quietly, Barrichello would carry the team in the middle stretch and really pull his weight. As Michael would struggle to find the points, Barrichello would outscore Schumacher from Monaco to the Germans' home race, 30 to 10. Those would be critical points for Ferrari and would set up Schumacher for an unbelievable finish to a season. Spa in particular was a great battle between Mika and Michael. It includes, in my opinion, one of the most entertaining and crucial overtakes in a championship battle we've seen to date. But let's set the stage a little bit. Hakkinen would go on to take pole and Schumacher would start on the second row from fourth place. And as the race got underway, he would quickly be promoted. Schumacher was on a mission and would take the race lead after Hakkinen's mistake on the 12th lap. And as the track began to dry out from some of the rain, Hakkinen would recover and start to get within striking distance of the German. With only a handful of laps to go, it's easy to remember their battle at the Macau Grand Prix. But they've traded that Formula 3 title for now a Formula 1 World Championship. But the intensity and the hunger was the exact same. He would approach Michael in eerily similar fashion from that 1990 event. But he seemed to remember and learn from that situation. He would abort the pass attempt and bide his time. On the very next lap, they came up on Zonta. Hakkinen would get in the slipstream of Schumacher and fainted to the left before choosing the right side of Zonta. The right-hand kink in the track allowed for Hakkinen to pass on the inside, go for a late break, and take the dominant position emerging from that right-hand flick as the race leader. And the race would ultimately conclude this way, with Michael in second and Ralf Schumacher in third rounding out the podium. After Belgium, Hakkinen was now ahead of Schumacher by 6 points with 74 to Michael's 68. McLaren were just 8 points ahead of Ferrari in the Constructors' Championship as well. So with 3 fourths of the season gone, the stakes are high, the tensions were even higher, but now, they were going to be battling at Ferrari's home turf at Monza. And just as Marinello needed this the most, Schumacher and Barrichello would deliver the Ferrari faithful a front row lockout. The race was not without incident though. Frenson, Barrichello, Trulli, and Coulthard were all caught up in a collision. In the midst of the chaos, a fire marshal was struck by a tire and tragically killed. The safety car would be deployed for a full 10 laps where the Schumacher brothers were split by Hakkinen. The race would go on and ultimately conclude in the same order. Schumacher's stellar drive earned him his 41st victory, matching Senna's record. This was obviously very emotional for Michael as he admired Ayrton and dedicated even his first title to Senna. He would go on to say the following about his victory. I have no vocabulary for anything higher than that. I'm sorry, but uh, I'm just happy. I'm just exhausted and... Yeah. I'm still not in the front of the championship, but this win is a big relief. There are 500 people working with us and all of them are part of this victory. And this really is a special moment between Schumacher and Hakkinen as it's one of those moments where we see the human side of the drivers. After Michael realizes that he's just tied Ayrton's record, he essentially breaks down in the middle of the press conference. Yes, it does mean a lot to me. And what I love most about this moment is Ralph is sitting directly next to Schumacher. And naturally, Ralph does end up consoling his brother. But the first person without hesitation that reaches over to console Michael is Mika. It doesn't feel cheap, it doesn't feel fake, it feels as real as it can possibly get. Mika actually looks concerned about Michael. It looked uh, really terrible. I mean, uh, when huh? someone was hurt at it. Which shouldn't be surprising, but to see it, I think really does speak to their rivalry, but more so their friendship. And what does make this one of the best rivalries we've seen on the grid? Just because they share this moment doesn't mean the racing is going to get any easier. The win in Italy cut Hakkinen's lead and Michael had now tallied 78 points to Mika's 80. At this stage, only 4 points separated McLaren and Ferrari, with just 3 races to go. Schumacher would execute one of the most clutch performances to end a season in recent championship battle memories. He ended the season taking 4 straight pole positions and 4 straight victories. Crucially, to mount tensions even higher, he lost early positions at three of those races. The first via David Coulthard at the US Grand Prix, and the second coming courtesy of Mika Hakkinen at the Malaysian Grand Prix. Japan especially saw an entertaining battle for pole, and in my opinion, one of the best pole battles we've seen in Formula 1 history, and for good reason. If Michael could win at Suzuka, he'd be crowned the champion, putting him mathematically clear on points. The Japanese Grand Prix had a familiar air of the 1989 and even the 1990 Suzuka showdown. Schumacher would eventually emerge ahead of Hakkinen in that pole battle at Japan. He'd edge the fin by .009 seconds. 
and as we moved into the race, it seemed like a common trend would emerge again. Hakkinen yet again would get away better off the line and overtake Michael going into the first turn. But Michael remained calm. He showed the exact same poise that the Finn had proven at Japan just one year ago which made him a double world champion. Schumacher would go on to show some brilliant driving and some brilliant strategy. He would leverage an overcut and as Hakkinen went into the pits, he stayed out three additional laps, putting in a particularly strong in lap. This would swing the title race from Schumacher trailing Hakkinen by two seconds to now Schumacher ahead by four seconds. Michael's composure would step in and he'd go on to win not only that race, but the 2000 season driver's title. This would also kick off a wave of Michael dominance from the 2000 season all the way to 2004. Following this rivalry from the Finns' first win at the end of the 1997 season, the next three years would turn into a classic showdown between Hakkinen and Schumacher. Eight years on from that Macau Grand Prix title fight, they would go on to also rule the F1 grid. And over the years, Schumacher has had some classic run-ins and tussles with those he considered his rivals. But Hakkinen was the first where he fought someone he felt truly was his equal behind the wheel. Up to that point, we rarely see Michael giving his nemesis the time of day. But of the short list of driver opinions that Michael seemingly cared the most about, it's no surprise that we have well-documented cases of not only Senna having the ear of the German, but Hakkinen. And just as Michael respected Senna, he clearly respected Hakkinen and for good reason. Let's take a look at the numbers and the rivalry from the 1998 season all the way through to the 2000 championship won by Michael. And these numbers exclude the races where Michael missed due to injury. But in the equal amount of races where they both were on the grid, Hakkinen would edge out Schumacher in points, 243 to 238. Similarly, Hakkinen would take 20 poles to Michael's 15. And after that season, we saw Hakkinen drop off in performance. And it was similar to what we saw sometimes in 1999. It seemed as though they had pushed each other. They made each other better. When we look at those three years where they both had the car to compete, there were only two occasions where they both were absent from the podium at the same time, even if only one of them finished and that was the European Grand Prix of 1999 and the Monaco Grand Prix of the year 2000. And that's what made this so special. The respect they had on and off the track showed, and it led to very hard, grueling seasons full of clean battles. And at the center of this story, a very special bond between two drivers while battling over the right to be the best driver in the world. A battle that started and ended a decade later with equally hard racing, but significantly greater respect for each other. But all good things must come to an end, and eventually Schumacher's reign would be toppled by another young driver. The young Spaniard would have something to say, as Fernando Alonso would now burst onto the scene, and he'd want to make a legacy of his own. But how did this happen? How did the unbeatable become beatable? Get all that next time on Formula One Wars. We'll take a look at Fernando Alonso's championship seasons, and how he became the new king of the grid. Thank you for your time and checking this out. As always, subscribe and hit the bell notification for more episodes of F1 Wars and F1 Rivalries. Make sure to leave your feedback and especially your video suggestions down below. Of course, I read all these and I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks for being here and I'll see you very, very soon. The most respected guy in all those years definitely was Mika Hakkinen. Great fights, but stable private relationship.